give the mind an exercise to do, like focusing on the breath, contemplating the virtues of the Buddha, developing goodwill. Even some of the practices that are said to be vipassana practices, they're all actually concentration practices. You tell the mind to do something and you will it to do something, and then you observe it. That's where the insight comes. And there's no telling what particular exercise is going to be the one that sparks insight for you, or the insights, because it's not just one insight. There are many insights. Because what we want to do is watch the mind in action. When the Buddha talks about ignorance, he's not saying that we're ignorant of, say, our true nature, in which case knowledge would be a, an either-or thing. Either you know or you don't know. He's saying that we're not skilled in the Four Noble Truths, not skilled in seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. We're not skilled in performing the duties or tasks that are appropriate to the Four Noble Truths. And so the insights come in the same way that you gain insights as you're mastering a skill, bit by bit. You try something and see the results. You try something else and see the results of that. And sometimes you can work away at the skill and no new insights come. And then in an odd moment, you suddenly see something you didn't see before. You notice ways in which you're doing it inefficiently or imprecisely. And that's, those are the insights. So you learn how to do things more skillfully, with more ease, more finesse. And sometimes the insights come as you're getting very, very subtle, the mind gets very still, things are very comfortable, and you notice a slight wavering in that stillness, slight wavering in that subtle pleasure or equanimity. And that's the signal to you that you've got to look into what happened. What did you do just now? Why was there this wavering? In other cases, insights come when you're finding yourself up against a wall. You're sitting, and all of a sudden a pain comes up, and it doesn't go away. And you've made your vows. When we're sitting here as a group, you're going to stay here for the whole hour regardless. And you find that's an hour of pain. And that requires that you gain some quick insights into why is it that the pain pains the mind. You can work with a breath to see if that makes any difference. But sometimes you find that regardless of how you breathe, the pain is going to stay there. So then you've got to take a new tack. Your old way of dealing with pain was either to run away from it or try to push it out. But here it's not going anywhere, and you're not going anywhere. So you're not, you've got to look at how is the mind processing the pain? How is it perceiving the pain? And this is where it's useful to ask some questions. Because a question is like a, a frame. You may have noticed when you take a picture of something, you can frame an object in many different ways and make it look very different by the way you frame it, either close up or move it off to the side or back from far away. And the mind's way of framing things is by asking questions. An important thing to ask is, is there any wavering in the pain? Is the pain one solid mass, or is it lots of little tiny pain bits? What happens if you perceive it as a solid mass, and what happens if you perceive it as little pain bits, little sparks of pain here and there? Ask yourself, does the pain move around? Does it stay 
strongest in one spot, or does that the strongest spot of the pain move around? And in that moving around, is it reflecting the movement of the mind or something in the body? And how do you see the way the pain is coming at you? Does it have to come at you? Can you see it as receding? In other words, as soon as there's a moment of pain arising, think it, remind yourself you're watching that particular moment pass away, pass away, pass away. It's like the difference between sitting in a car facing forward and sitting in the same car facing backward as you go down a road. If you're facing forward, everything is coming at you, coming at you, coming at you. And with pain, there's a sense that it's coming at you and you're holding on to it. You're catching it like a ball being thrown at you. But if you turn around and sit facing the back of the car, like you could do in those old station wagons, just see things going past, going past, going past. And there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. What does that do to your relationship to the pain? So lots of different ways you can question the pain. And again, these are ways of setting up a particular way of doing things, a way of relating to the pain, and see where it results. In some cases you see a difference, in other cases you don't see a difference. But try to detect what way of perceiving the pain helps to alleviate that sense of being burdened by the pain. Because you can ask yourself, the fact that there's a physical pain in the body, why does it have to burden the mind? Ever since we were small, it was taken for granted. Yes, it is a burden on the mind that there has to be a pain in the body. But you can ask yourself, why does it have to be the case? Does it have to be the case right now? Can you see the pain as one thing, the awareness of the pain as something else, the body as something else? The body, after all, is just earth, water, wind, and fire, solidity, liquidity, warmth, coolness, energy, motion. These qualities are the body. Is the pain any one of those? It's something else. It's this sensation, this biting sensation that flits around here and there. But if you glom it together with your perception of the body, I think it's going to seem a lot more solid and a lot more oppressive. So can you separate those perceptions? And as you see, the issue is the way you perceive things, the labels you put on things, the mental image you hold in your mind. As the Buddha said, there are some people gain insight with ease and other people gain insight with pain. The ones who gain insight with ease they're in very strong states of concentration, and for them the, the stress or the dukkha that comes up is very subtle, but it's enough for them to see oh, something happened in the mind, and they check it out. Now other people are more stubborn. They have to be faced with really serious pain before the mind is willing to get, in, get into gear and start asking questions and start getting curious. And we can't determine beforehand which kind of person we're going to be. And it's not the case that you're going to be one person all the way down the line, or one sort of person. Sometimes you'll have insights when things are very comfortable, and other times you'll have insights when things are very painful. But it's important that you understand that the insight is about action. When you look at a John Lee's analogies for the arising of insight, making baskets and then observing what you've made, making clay tiles and trying to think up new ways of making them, getting a piece of silver, putting in a smelter and see what different things you can do with it. All these are images of skill, activities. And then though he has another set of images in the going to a, a mountain, getting out a, a rock, and then putting the rock in a smelter and subjecting it to heat. The heat here is the heat of your effort. You stick with something and you watch it and you watch it and you watch it. You put up with the pain, 
but you're not here just to endure the pain, although endurance certainly helps, but the endurance is not going to burn away your old karma. As a John Cha once said, if endurance were enough to gain awakening, all the chickens in the world would have awakened a long time ago. They can sit a lot longer than we can. You want to be able to be with the pain so you can start observing. Where exactly is the pain in the mind? Because that's the pain of the Four Noble Truths. The pain in the body, that's the pain of the three characteristics. Wherever there's inconstancy, there's going to be stress. And whatever is stressful, the Buddha said, is not self. So that's not the issue. The issue is the, the suffering that comes from your craving, your ignorance. And the ignorance is just that, your inability to see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths and to master the skills that are appropriate to each of the truths. What that means in practice is you've got some pain in the mind, you want to comprehend it. What's the pain in the mind? What's the pain in the body? How can you tell the difference? Can you see any wavering in the pain in the mind? And when it wavers, ask yourself, what happened? What change in perception happened? And as you try to maintain your steadiness as you watch this and holding that question in mind, trying to understand this pain, that's the path. So we're trying to get at the mind from different angles to see which angle works, giving us some insight into how the mind, in its frantic efforts to find pleasure, keeps causing itself more and more pain, and how you can train it to be observant, to ask questions about cause and effect, and to watch and experiment, to become more skillful as you approach the issue of suffering and pain in your life. This is one of the things that was really distinctive about the Buddha's teachings. You look at the teachings that were taught by other teachers at the time, and nobody else focused on the issue of stress and pain. They had bigger ideas, They're trying to comprehend the world as a whole. They had their scientific worldview, which in some cases was just as materialistic as some of the worldviews we have around us now, which everything was determined and there was no free will. And as the Buddha pointed out, if there's no free will, then there's no chance of getting any release from suffering, pain. Then the other people say, well, you've got to get your soul out of this constant cycling. So again, it was just putting up with the pain so that your soul would be released. But the Buddhist teaching was very different. He said, just try to understand the process of how you experience pain and how your ignorance and craving contribute to that and how you can put an end to that ignorance and craving and the release from suffering that follows. Just the fact that that was his big issue, that was framing the question in a very distinctive way. And of course, it provides new insights. If you look at other issues as being the big issues in life, you're going to miss this issue. So try to focus on this issue. How does the mind create pain? How does it create suffering? And you find that the insights that arise are very productive. into giving rise to a happiness that lies beyond the Four Noble Truths, totally unconditioned. Because that's the earnest question in life, is why do we create suffering when we want happiness? And how can we find a happiness that we can trust? It's probably our most earnest question, and the Buddha was ready to answer that question straight on. So 
So try adjusting your focus that you're approaching it straight on as well.